Hello, APUSH students. This video will go over the first of our nine periods of study. This period covers the time period before Columbus reached the Western Hemisphere, as well as Spanish colonization. Looking at the title of this slide, A Race for Empire, it does imply competition. European powers will be competing to create the strongest empire in the world. First, the early inhabitants and their descendants spread across the two continents, reaching the tip of South America perhaps 11,000 years ago. As the climate warmed, they faced a food crisis as the immense animals they hunted, including woolly mammoths and giant bison, became extinct. Around 9,000 years ago, at the same time that agriculture was being developed in the Near East, it also emerged in modern-day Mexico and the Andes, and then spread to other parts of the Americas, making settled civilizations possible. Throughout the hemisphere, maize, or corn, squash, and beans form the basis of agriculture. The absence of livestock in the Western Hemisphere, however, limited farming by preventing the plowing of fields and the application of natural fertilizer. Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire in what is now Mexico, was one of the world's largest cities. Its great temple, splendid royal palace, and a central market comparable to that of European capitals made the city seem like an enchanted vision, according to one of the first Europeans to encounter it. Now we're going to discuss the Native Americans before 1492. We'll do it region by region. First, we'll start with the Southwest. Many distinct tribes lived in the Southwest starting around 7,000 BCE. Ancestral Pueblo tribes like the An Anasazi, Mogollon, and Hokoam began farming in the Southwest as early as 2000 BCE, producing corn, while Navajos and Apaches primarily hunted and gathered. These ancient tribes left the area around 1300 CE, most likely due to crop failure. European colonists encountered a group of people partially descended from the ancestral Pueblos in the mid 1500s. In the West, many distinct tribes lived in this region. Hunting, gathering, fishing supplied most of the food, especially along the Columbia and Colorado rivers. The West provided ample food and trading goods, which allowed natives to establish sedentary villages. In the Northeast, natives in that region began to rely primarily on agriculture between 200 BCE and 500 CE. The farming of squash, beans, and corn established more permanent and larger villages throughout the Ohio River Valley. The Iroquois League, an agreement established between five Iroquois spe speaking groups in the late 1300s, prevented intertribal violence. In the Southeast, agriculturally productive, uh, it is an agriculturally productive region for many different reasons. Mississippian culture, which was the dominant culture, created immense wealth, allowing natives to build enormous mounds and organized urban centers. The five civilized tribes created chiefdoms and later alliances with the colonists. Many of the tribes became socially and economically stratified. Finally, in the Plains region, here are natives lived in a variety of sedentary and nomadic communities. They farmed corn, hunted, and gathered, and established diverse lifestyles and healthy diets. When the Spanish brought horses, it disrupted their agriculture and intensified hunting competition between native groups. On the right, you will see an engraving from a drawing by an early French colonist of Florida. The aboriginal communities of Florida were hierarchical with classes and hereditary chiefs, some of whom were women. A queen is being carried on an ornamental litter by men of rank. This is further evidence of diversity and burgeoning social structures of Native America. On the left, you will see Indian women planting crops. Marco Polo was probably the most famous Westerner traveling on the Silk Road for over 24 years. He reached further than any of his predecessors beyond Mongolia to China. Although he received very little recognition from the geographers of his time, some of the information in his book was incorporated in some of the important maps of the later Middle Ages. His system of measuring distances by day's journey has turned out to be very accurate. Marco Polo introduced two things to the West that they had not had before, silk and gunpowder. Men and women immediately were awed by the silk, its strength, and vibrant colors. While gunpowder was used at the time, mainly in China, for fireworks, the force of the explosions inspired Marco Polo that could be used for other purposes. The rest of the history with the advent of pistols, rifles, and cannons. Religion was the major force driving man's choices. The Crusades slowly tore down the structure of feudal society when the church was all-powerful in the center of man's life and replaced it with a society that became more defined by the nation-state, materialism, and the individual. 
eventually producing the Reformation and the Renaissance. The Crusades contributed to the increase of wealth of the Church and the power of the papacy. Thus, the prominent part which the popes took in the enterprises naturally fostered their authority and influence by placing it in their hands, the armies and resources of Christendom, and accustoming the people to look to them as guides and leaders. One of the most important effects of the Crusades was on commerce. They created a constant demand for the transportation of men and supplies, encouraged shipbuilding, and extended the market for eastern wares in Europe. They also helped to undermine feudalism. Thousands of barons and knights mortgaged or sold their lands in order to raise money for a crusading expedition. As to the political effects of the Crusades, they helped to break down the power of the feudal aristocracy and give prominence to kings and the people. At the same time, the cities also gained many political advantages at the expense of crusading barons and princes. Money was largely in the hands of the upper class, and in return for the contributions and loans they made to their overlords, they received charters conferring special and valuable privileges. Amongst the effects of the Holy Wars on the material development of Europe must be mentioned as they cause commercial enterprise, especially to the trade and commerce of the Italian cities. The Black Death began in Constantinople in 1347. It decimated Europe, killing more than a third of the people of the continent and debilitating the economy. 150 years later, the population had already rebounded. With that growth came a rise in land values, a reawakening of commerce, and an increase in prosperity. Landlords were becoming eager to purchase goods from distant regions, and a new merchant class was emerging. As trade increased, and advances in navigation shipbuilding made distance, more, uh, distance travel more feasible, interest in developing new markets, finding new products, and opening new trade routes rapidly increased. At the same time, the rise of new governments that were more united and powerful than the feeble uh, political entities of the past. In western areas of Europe, the authority of the distant pope and the even more distant Holy Roman Emperor was, this, was very weak. As a result, strong new monarchs were, were emerging, and they were creating centralized nation-states with courts, armies, and tax systems. These ambitious kings and queens consolidated their power and increased their wealth, and became eager to enhance the commercial growth of their nations. Here are the consequences and effects of the Black Death. Prices and wages went up. Greater value was placed on labor. Farming land was given over to pasturing, which was much less labor-intensive. This change in farming led to a boost in the cloth and woolen industry. Peasants moved from the country to the towns. The Black Death was therefore also responsible for the decline of the feudal system. People became disillusioned with the church, and its power and influence went into decline, ultimately resulting in the English Reformation. The Crusades and Marco Polo's journey began an outline of a spider's web that brought about the globalization for the first time in our history. Globalization is a process by which businesses or other organizations develop international influence or start operating on an international scale. The Renaissance led to the spread of literacy, curiosity, and adventure. It led to the questioning of church teachings. Long-standing beliefs were tested. Reformation produced religious tolerance and shifted power from the church to kings. With a tax base from merchants who wanted peace and security that would enhance and spread goods and markets, kings increased their power as the feudalism and manor system died, giving way to pre-capitalist economies. Okay, so here are your causes of European expansion. You've got religion. The Crusades are going to provide intellectual stimulation for man to attempt to reconcile faith with reason. This quest will eventually produce the Renaissance and the Reformation. There's going to be a huge religious impulse to halt the spread of Muslims and spread Christianity. This is where Catholicism and Protestantism will fight for supremacy once they suppress the Muslims. Second, you have competition for trade. Marco Polo's journey to China, as well as the Crusades, will mark the beginning of the end of feudalism and the manor system. As trade and commerce grow, towns and middle class develop, producing merchants, guilds, and a capitalist system. Here you have uh, four different forms of technology that developed during this period. You have, of course, uh, the printing press spreading information during the Renaissance. You have Portuguese Prince Henry, the navigator, establishing the Naval Co Academy. And his research is going to be geared towards getting to India and China by sea. A ship known as the Caravel may travel by sea much easier. Europeans borrowed the compass from the Muslims who had then in turn taken it from the Chinese. They also will improve uh, the astrolabe and the quadrant 
to make it easier to use on new ships. The Italian city-states of Venice, Genoa, and Milan controlled spice trade with, with China as the bankers and distributors of the goods. The Ottoman Turks, however, began to charge a tribute to those using the Silk Road and anyone that wanted to move their goods. This increased the cost of trade with China. So the Portuguese decided to try and find a different route, an eastern water route beginning in 1486, and as they sailed across the western coast of Africa. Columbus had a different idea. He wanted to sail west in order to go east. He believed the western route was shorter, and he had based his theory on his knowledge of Portuguese expeditions in the Verde Islands. He was rejected by the Portuguese and then by Spain, but once the Moors were defeated in 1492, the Spanish had changed their mind, and they agreed to finance the voyage. Christopher Columbus will convince the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella to outfit three ships. They promised Columbus the titles of Admiral, Viceroy, and Governor of lands, of any lands that he might uh, claim for Spain. He sailed west and landed on the Bahamas in 1492. Okay, as you can see, these are the European explorers that are going to be very important to... Uh, your AP exam will start, of course, with Chris Christopher Columbus, who was an Italian, but he sailed on behalf of Spain. He reached Hispaniola in the Bahamas uh, in the year 1492. John Cabot is also an Italian. He will, in turn, uh, sail for England, and he will reach Canada, in fact, Newfoundland, in 1497. And you have the Portuguese sailor Pedro Cabral, who claim Brazil in the year 1500. But if you look at the map on the right-hand side of your of the slide here, you will see all the different explorers. All right, another group of explorers that you need to you know. Uh, these are pretty famous guys. You've got Balboa, Magellan, Cortez, and Pizarro. Um, all four of these gentlemen are Spanish. Balboa will be the first European to see the Pacific Ocean. Magellan will attempt to sail around the world, but he will be killed in the Philippines. Cortez is best known for conquering the Aztecs, and Pizarro was able to conquer the Incas. So, these are your important Spanish explorers. This is a famous painting called The Landing of Columbus by John Vanderlyn. This is painted in 1837. Uh, when you see a document like this, especially on the AP exam, you need to kind of look at when it was done, when it was painted. Um, but let's first look at the painting itself. How does Columbus appear in the painting? Well, he's looking up, uh, kind of looking up in gratitude for his safe passage and appears to be very humble before God. And look what he's look, holding in his left hand, the flag of Spain. Um, looking at the sailors who accompany him, um, how do they appear? Well, they appear to be aggressive, eager to look for gold, and uh, excited for this new conquest. If you look at the Native Americans on the right-hand side of the painting, you will see that the, most of them are hiding, they are afraid, very weary of these new people. So let me go back to what it says about uh, the year 1836. That, of course, is a year where the United States is expanding, and so they, of course, would have a positive view of Columbus. So okay, so that brings me to Columbus. And the big question, that we need to answer is was Columbus a hero or a villain? There's two different ways to look at uh, Christopher Columbus's quote unquote discovery of America. Some people look at him as a discoverer and pioneer of progress, while others look at him as a mass murderer or pioneer of destruction. Okay, so the big question that College Board might ask you, and something that you could answer maybe in a short answer question, is was his contribution a discovery, invasion, or an encounter? So in answering any question like this, you could choose any of the three. Any of the three could be correct, but the important thing to remember is can you support it with evidence? And you could support any of those three with empirical evidence to back up your response. All right, so let's talk about historiography. Historiography, of course, is uh, how the current times affect the view of history. And here you see two different statements about Columbus, and they happen at two different times. It's important to understand what's happening in America during this period and how it affects our view of Columbus. So in 1892, President Benjamin Harrison said Columbus was a pioneer of progress and enlightenment. 
if you think about what the United States is going through in 1892, it's a period of uh, expansion, manifest destiny, moving westward. So Columbus kind of represents that. A hundred years later, in 1992, Columbus is a pioneer of oppression, racism, slavery, rape, theft, vandalism, genocide, environmental destruction. So in the 90s, we started looking at the other side and how Native Americans were impacted by Columbus's uh, exploration. So the important thing you need to know here for the AP exam, of course, the really most important thing you need to know is the Columbia Exchange and the exchange of uh, fruits, vegetables, animals, diseases between the new and old world. So take a look at this chart, pause here, and look and see what has been transferred from either side. Notice that livestock, like cattle, sheep, pigs, and horses, did not exist in the new world until Columbus arrived. Also, things like tomatoes, potatoes, uh, beans, squash, pineapple, did not exist in the old world. But the most important thing you need to see is that the diseases that were transferred to the Americas, like smallpox and influenza. So let's next look at the impact of Columbia Exchange on Europe. Looking at the map here, this is Europe in 1500, and four main things happened. You have increased in urbanization in Western Europe as less people needed to farm, they moved to urban areas. You also saw an increase in the GDP. GDP means gross domestic product. That's the sum of all goods and services produced in a country within a year. The goods and services produced increased per person or per capita in Western Europe. You also saw increased Atlantic trade and a decline of feudalism in turning into more pre-capitalistic or capitalistic economies. Overall, you can see the, the impact of the Columbia Exchange on Europe being positive. On the other hand, we look at the effect of the Columbia Exchange on the Americas. Native populations pre-Columbus could be anywhere between 2 and 5 million. The native populations in the United States as of 1900 was 250,000. It's estimated there was a total loss of 80 million people due to disease. So some other numbers here, Hispaniola estimated to have 1 million people in 1492, completely disappeared by 1542, only 50 years later. In Mexico, there was over 20 million indigenous populations and there are less than 2 million today. This painting depicts the fall of the Aztec capital to Tenochtitlan. Although numerous battles were fought between the Aztec Empire and the Spanish-led coalition, um, it was the siege of the capital, most of which was determined by a smallpox epidemic that defeated or killed off most of the Aztec leadership, led to the victory for the Spanish. The conquest of Mexico was a critical stage in the Spanish colonization of the Americas. Ultimately, Spain conquered Mexico and then gained substantial access to the Pacific Ocean, meaning the Spanish Empire could finally achieve its original goal of reaching the Asian markets. I want you to read the quote at the bottom right, pause the video, and see the what people thought of the capital of the Aztec Empire. In the early 16th century, the Spanish crown set up the encomienda system in the Americas to divide up American Indian labor force to aid the development of their mining economy. Under this system, the Spanish conquistador which was typically a prominent male Spaniard, was granted the labor of a certain number of Native Americans who lived in the area. He provided the laborers protection from warring tribes and taught them Catholicism. The Native laborer paid tributes to the Spaniard in the form of gold or other metals or sometimes even agricultural products. The system was intended to be a way to enter a peaceful and mutual beneficial relationship with the indigenous people of America. However, it devolved quickly into a system of slavery. Native Americans were treated cruelly and forced into hard labor. The Spanish crown attempted to fix the system by passing laws throughout the century, but most of the conquistadors refused to comply with these measures. Eventually, it was replaced with a different system and completely abolished by the late 18th century. The caste system was supposed to provide an order and clarity to the Spanish racial mixtures and establish a hierarchy of social status, wealth, and legal rights. When the Spanish colonial period ended in 1821, there were over 100 different racial categories. If you look at the pyramid, there are four main groups that you will see. You have the Peninsulares, who were born in Spain. They came over to rule there at the top, followed by the Creoles, who are of European descent, but they were born in the colonies. Then you have the mixture, the Mestizo, 
who are mixed Native American European, and then you have mulattoes who are mixed African descent. At the very bottom are the Native Americans and the enslaved Africans. Looking at the chart on the left, you will notice that there are 14 or so different racial, 15 or so different racial categories. The Spanish will exploit the labor of both the indigenous people of the Americas as well as importing Africans. The enslavers justified their wealth and status by considering them inferior beings with limited capacity and held them as personal property under horrible conditions. Spain first enslaved Native Americans on Hispaniola and then replaced them with captive Africans. This mural will summarize 300 years of mistreatment of the indigenous populations by the colonizing Spanish and will symbolize the motives behind the conquest. The Spanish flag, the Catholic cross, and the sword are the three symbols of the conquest and often represent the political, religious, and military power of the Spanish used to colonize the area. The position of the last emperor of the Aztec Empire in relation to the standing position of the conquistador really explain this, what's going on in the painting. The Spanish will brand some Indians and will symbolize that they were treated like animals. The Spanish will whip the Indians like animals, but if you look at the faces, the Spanish look like animals and the Indians look more human. One of the most important things you need to remember about this period is the Pueblo Revolt. Having found wealth in Mexico, the Spanish looked north to expand their empire into the land of the Pueblo people. The Spanish expected present-day New Mexico to yield gold and silver, but they were mistaken. Instead, they established a political base in Santa Fe in 1610, naming it the capital of the Kingdom of New Mexico. As they had in other Spanish colonies, missionaries built churches and forced the Pueblo to convert to Catholicism requiring the native people to discard their own religious practices entirely. They focused on conversion projects, drawing them away from their parents and traditions. In 1680, the Pueblo launched a coordinated attack on the Spanish. Pueblos, Navajos, and Apaches from the region congregated and planned to strike Santa Fe when the Spaniards were low on supplies. They laid siege to the city for nine days and cut off the Spanish water supply. The uprising, known as Pope's Rebellion, killed over 400 Spaniards and drove the remaining 2,000 Spanish settlers south towards Mexico. Participants in the rebellion also destroyed many mission churches in an effort to diminish Catholic physical presence on Pueblo land. Some refer to it as the First American Revolution. On June 7, 1494, the governments of Spain and Portugal agreed to the Treaty of Tordesillas, named for the city in Spain. The Treaty of Tordesillas neatly divided the New World between the two superpowers. Spain and Portugal divided the New World by drawing a line in the Atlantic Ocean. All lands west of that line were claimed by Portugal. All lands, sorry, all lands east of that line were claimed by Portugal. All lands west of that line were claimed by Spain. Spain and Portugal adhered to the treaty without any major conflict, and the results can be seen today. Portugal colonized Brazil, and today Portuguese is the leading official language of Brazil. The treaty ignored any future claims of the British and the French and the other European superpowers of the time. The British, French, and Russian empires did not claim parts of the Americas for years after the Treaty of Tordesillas. Most importantly, however, it completely ignored the millions of people already living in those established communities in the Americas. Finally, uh, if you look at the title of the slide, what effects did the discovery of gold have on European economies? While gold caused a massive inflation in Europe, the price of goods went up significantly. Spain failed to invest in its own country. They purchased expensive items from European nations like Holland and Britain and did not develop their own economies. The money ended up being scattered all over Europe. The ordinary Spanish people did not benefit and Spain's economy was destroyed from what had happened. This is the end of the video for period one. Make sure you go back and take notes on what you have seen here.